to get started. My name is Sonia Epstein. I'm the executive editor and associate curator of science and film here at the Museum of the Moving Image. I curate this series, which is called Science on Screen, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you here today for Wild Lives. So Science on Screen explores everything from seahorses to robots to dust, bringing scientists and filmmakers to the museum for wide-ranging discussions uh, that offer new perspectives on scientific topics and ideas. Science on Screen is a nationwide initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Today's screening is a rare opportunity to see two remarkable films. The American Museum of Natural History was generous and adventurous enough to open their library's expansive film collection to me, a very strange and culturally, and I would say scientifically, significant incidents in their history is represented in the first film that we'll see today, which is called Meshi, Child of a Chimpanzee. Henry Cushy Raven, the then Associate Curator of Comparative Anatomy at the American Museum of Natural History, shot footage for this film between 1931 and 32. Raven spent his career traveling to collect specimens for museum display. He also wrote and published papers and books about marsupials, marine mammals, and apes, including a monolith on the anatomy of the gorilla. The more outlandish part of his biography begins in 1929 when he was on an expedition in West Africa. He was hunting gorillas to taxidermy, ultimately, and he ended up adopting as a pet a one-year-old chimpanzee who became known as Meshi, a name which means little swagger, which was uh, perhaps a reference to the way that she walked. Raven brought her, rather nonchalantly from the accounts uh, that I've read, back with him to Long Island with uh, apparently no warning to his wife or three kids, including the then four-year-old Harry Raven, who is here with us today. Meshi lived on Long Island with frequent trips to AM and H, the Explorers Club, and even fancy dinners for four years until Raven left for another expedition in 1934 when she was five years old. He gave Meshi to the Chicago Zoo. She died in childbirth a few years later and is now on display in the Hall of Primates at AM and H, named only as chimpanzee troglodytes. Raven filmed Meshi, as I said, between 1931 and 32, showing off her human-like behavior and presented these films to museum members, often with Meshi in person, so to speak, to, quote, enhance the popular appreciation of the very man-like mentality of the chimpanzee. So I want to say before we start the film that I, I, I do find this film a little bit difficult uh, to watch. My heart breaks sort of um, for a lot of people and Meshi in this film. Um, and I think Raven's actions and attitudes, you know, can be considered perhaps in a different light today, which we will have an opportunity to do after the screening in discussion with two experts. So, as I mentioned, with us here today, we are very lucky to have Raven's son, Harry, who you will see featured in the film as a four and five year old. Screening right after Meshi, we will see Philip Bornell's award-winning documentary about a very different but similarly bizarre instance in New York history. Ming of Harlem made its U.S. premiere at the New York Film Festival in 2014 and has gone on to win awards and to screen at festivals around the world. I'm so pleased that Philip could be here with us today. He's an artist, filmmaker, writer, and associate professor and director of studies on experimental film at Kingston University in London. We are also extremely lucky to have with us the pioneering researcher Diana Reese, who will join Philip on stage after both films for a conversation. Diana is a professor and director of the Animal Behavior and Conservation Masters and Certificate Programs in the Department of Psychology at Hunter College and a professor in Animal Behavior and Comparative Psychology Doctoral Program at the Graduate Center CUNY. So I encourage all of you to stick around for our discussion after the screenings of Meshi and Ming, which total two hours runtime. And I hope that now you will join me in welcoming Harry Raven to the stage to say a few words. Some people, some 
people that they're feeling the need for exercise, they lie down until the feeling goes away. <laughs> now, Meshi, the first time I saw Meshi, uh, my older sister Jane and I, uh, my father led us down to the basement, and Mary was, um, Meshi was in a box about this big, and my father had put some burlap bags as a cushion and the little chimpanzee was lying there, a small box, and uh, I looked at her. I was unimpressed. Uh, I would have loved to have a little puppy. Uh, the chimpanzee, not so much. I think my older sister felt the same way. She was not our pet. She was our father's pet. Now he first met machine that would have been oh, maybe, uh, 18 months earlier. He was in Australia, uh, Africa. Uh, he had been uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a mission sponsored by the Smithsonian Institute. He was an employee of the American Museum of Natural History. And he went to Africa and was there four years, but he uh, suffered from malaria and sleeping sickness. He was out in the jungle uh, in a camp chair and feeling awful. And he heard one of the older guides that he, hunters that he had employed, say, this man will die tonight. And my father told them, you keep bringing me strong tea. You keep me awake. And he survived. But uh, he stayed in the little village for a year because he just was not well enough to board a ship and come back to the United States. And uh, while he was recuperating one day, uh, two uh, African hunters came back to the village with a dead female chimpanzee and a little baby, and that was Meshi. Well, my father uh, bargained and bought her, and he kept her close to him in the village, and she would play with the children, chained or tied, tethered. And uh, a year later, he, uh, they boarded a ship, came to Boston, and then back to Baldwin, Long Island out here, and uh, she, she had, and my father definitely had bonded. They had a very, very close feeling for each other. And he was the alpha male, and uh, she was devoted to him. But the chimpanzee, as you will see in the film, uh, she was. She uh, almost a celebrity. Uh, people came to see uh, this little chimpanzee. Now, at that time, um, uh, it, it was legal to have a chimpanzee in the home. Now, almost all states prohibit owning an animal like a chimpanzee in the house for very good reason. Nice little chimpanzees, so they. They can grow up. An alpha male chimpanzee can be 200 pounds. Now I weighed 121 pounds this morning. I wouldn't <laughs> want to annoy a 200 pound male gorilla. Well, Meshi uh, did not grow to that height, but she was almost as big as me and unpredictable. I have a scar on my hand when she bit me. Um, I was about eight years old, and on a Sunday afternoon, the family was sitting in the backyard. Meshi was chained, seated on a chair, and my father turned to me and said, go get her uh, an orange. I went in the house, I came back, and Meshi was like this. <laughs> she saw that orange, she wanted that orange. And as I approached, she grabbed my arm, bow, bit me up the orange. After the blood was cleaned up, things calmed down, my father said to me, 
you took too long to give it to her. <laughs> so, that's it. Uh, but the, uh, you will see in the film how the chimpanzee uh, learned by imitating. Uh, she could, she was a marvel. My father could tie her up with a piece of clothesline knots and let, let her lie on the ground and figure out what to do. She could figure out what to do. You will see how she uh, was able to get out of those nuts because of her dexterity. Uh, you can see the way she moves, climbs. Uh, most human beings, especially we people in the United States, we can't do that. And uh, you see how uh, uh, she could, you, you watch and see how she could, the wheels were working, she could figure things out. She learned how to ride a tricycle, watching me ride my tricycle. And um, four years in the house, um, I want to point out, you will see in the film, uh, scenes which were posed and set up for the movie. Those scenes in which my older sister appears, all scenes in which my older sister appeared, was set up by my father for the movie. They did not represent everyday events. Okay, that's uh, about it. I'm going to start. Okay, welcome back. Um, so I just want to start uh, by asking each of you uh, if you have any thoughts after seeing both of these films together. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts after yeah. seeing this film. Um, they're fascinating for so many different ways. Um, so I'm a scientist, I study animal behavior and I study animal thinking and we study animals in all sorts of situations. I think I want to put, I want to talk about um, the first film we saw. Should we just yeah. go jump right into it? So, you know, whenever we think about science that gets done or interactions with animals specifically, like the film we saw, we have to put it into perspective. At least I try to put it into perspective about the time that this happened. So let me try to do that for you guys a little bit. Um, so uh, this, this, this happened in, uh, he, uh, Harry Raven found, was, uh, acquired this animal, this chimpanzee, Menchie, in 31. Now, let's go back a little bit. Remember, for a long time, until really recently, people thought that animals didn't think, that we were the only thinking species, and that we thought that animals were, not we now, but people thought that animals were devoid of thought, that there was a complete disconnection, um, particularly even with our closest living relatives, which are chimpanzees, that they were non-thinking. We all know Jane Goodall's work that really brought their abilities to light and that, but that wasn't until the 1960s. This this film was made in 1931, and you know Charles Darwin back in in the 18 you know in the 1800s looked at chimpanzees and saw a connection, saw not only a physical connection but suggested an emotional and cognitive connection with other primates. So this work was interesting because it was one of the first times that people really did what's called home rearing with chimpanzees. In about, in about the 1930s, there were a whole group of people, um, psychologists and psych even psychiatrists, who brought chimpanzees in to see what would happen if you home reared them. Now, we can think, that's nuts. You know, now we can look at this and say, wow, they were really taking chances. I mean, who would put their baby in the arms of a chimpanzee? Who would put a chimpanzee in front of a fireplace with their baby? But I mean, I, I mean, that was my reaction. And I've worked with chimpanzees, but at that time, this was this idea. And again, I'm, I want to go back. I want to skip ahead. I'm going back through time. Darwin first started speculating the, of this connection between us and the rest of the animal world, and he was right. There is this connection, not just physical, but psychological and emotional. <coughs> then in the seven, and then. Um, in the, again, in the about 1931 and through the 30s, there were people who started suggesting that if we taught chimpanzees to communicate, maybe we would learn more about them. 
If, what if we taught them sign language? Robert Yerkes, many of you have heard of Robert Yerkes, was a primatologist. Um, in his book, Almost Human, speculated that it, maybe we could communicate with chimps if we taught them sign language. Maybe they couldn't vocalize, but they could sign. So the ideas were out there. And that's really important to say. So this didn't come out of nothing. I mean, here was this man who was um, going out, and he was an adventurer. He was working for the American Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian. And he suddenly presented with this young chimpanzee, who probably would have died if he had not taken her. And had this idea again that was sort of out there to bring it in the home. Yeah. So I'm going to stop there, and then we can talk about it more. Okay, just yeah, wanted to put it in that perspective. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a really interesting juxtaposition the two films. And um, um, I mean, as a filmmaker, probably my thoughts are usually on the kind of politics of bringing animals to the screen. What what does that involve? Um, how is it kind of this kind of if you like sort of problem relative to uh, a strange combination which is kind of love and ownership and how that's played out on the screen um, actually in both films but of course the second film my film is made in the absence of that being a real situation whereas the first film is that played out on a daily basis so uh, the, 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 the love and ownership confusion I would say is one of the kind of key issues for me but then Perhaps as well, um, the very notion, just to press the ownership point, the very notion of owning an animal, or, and owning a, a sentient creature, um, not, not necessarily the domestic animal, but other creatures, other minds, wild minds, um, uh, it, it is something that both films draw our attention to in very kind of strange ways. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just explain really briefly, Philip, how you filmed what you, you know, your film? I think people might be curious. Yeah, um, so I mean, it was kind of um, double edged uh, relationship to develop the film. One was to spend a little bit of time um, uh, care of the New York City Housing Association at Drew Hamilton Houses where Ming, Al, and Antoine lived. And then we invited Antoine to come back and kind of, you know, get a kind of flavour of his recollections in the neighbourhood. Um, and then a year later, actually, I kind of reimagined rather than reenacted his relationship to the, 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 the space of the apartment through working, uh, actually constructing a set in two zoos in the UK. Uh, one was built in a tiger enclosure outdoors in a, an existing tiger, tiger enclosure. And that's where you saw the tiger roaming. It was effectively yeah. in its living space. And then a second in the um, Conservation Centre for Crocodiles and Alligators in Oxford, of all places. Um, and um, so then the kind of, it, you know, the, that material was woven into the fabric of a more kind of documentary structure. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I. I, I was not breathing well when I was watching that <laughs> with that tiger. And I kept on, you know, and I was watching him scent mark in those areas. And there are probably people around the set, I suspect, and he was smelling a lot of that and scent marking, which they'll do. But I, I hope you guys can appreciate why exotics don't make good pets after seeing both of those films. Yeah. I mean, that's a really important message to get out. So. I mean, it certainly is an important message because there's. Uh, a reading up on the latest stats, there's at least, uh, in, in zoos and private ownership in the US, there's at least 7,000 tigers. And most of them are in compounds at the back of the house in, in a ranch kind of environment. Yeah, so yeah, that message um, still needs to be going yeah, There's a huge black market for exotics. And again, you know, I think this is something I, we really want to stress here, that how many people here love animals, other animals? Because we're part of the animals. We're animals too, obviously. Yeah. And it's important. We want to love them, and we want to protect them. And we want to protect them out in the wild where they are. And make sure that we're, you know, we're doing the right things, and we, because a lot of these animals are in great danger all over the world, and in, you know, and so we want to try to think about fixing it out there for them, but not bringing them into our house, where our homes. And again, it's not saying don't love them because we all appreciate that feeling. You know, I, I think many of you, I certainly was the same way as Antoine was in one way. 
I think when he was younger, he saved a lot of animals that he saw needed rescuing. He talked about birds that he would save and things like that. Most of you probably did the same thing. We saw those animals that were injured. That's a good thing to try to help them. It's another thing, but they're play rescue centers. If you find an injured raccoon or a baby, you know, a baby raven or something, a young raven, there are birds, sanctuaries, there are places. Locally, you can take animals. Know the right places to go. Yeah. Don't bring them into your home because they're going to get big and you're going to have problems. And I think, Harry, you, you had talked about that. As the animals got older, they get difficult and we can't address their needs. And I think we need to think in the long run. They may be okay when they're quite young, but as they get older, they really need more than we can give them. So, Well, just to jump, that, that does... Uh, one thing I wanted to ask was, um, you know, there is also, is, is about what happened to these animals after, uh, you know, aside from what we saw on the screen, because I, I think that there are challenges with placing enculturated uh, animals. Um, so I don't know if Diane, maybe you want to speak about why that is and why, um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I study dolphin behavior, and, um, but a lot of my colleagues work with chimpanzees. So many of you have heard of Washoe, who was the first chimp to learn American Sign Language officially. And that, I want to start with a good news case, because Washoe was um, actually brought to this country because her, mo uh, she was, her mother was killed, as we heard a lot of animals uh, young animals lose their mothers because they're killed. And um, historically in our country and other countries when they would do dioramas for facilities like you know American Museum of Natural History or other places that what we didn't know enough about these animals and often what they would do is they would kill the animals and then stuff them. They would be they would they would that's what we see in most of the museums. And a lot of those animals had babies and then those babies would be brought to zoos. Washa was actually um, brought to the United States because she was going to be used in the, in the space programs where they sent chimps up to space. Mm -hmm. But a couple, Gardner, um, Alan, um, what am I forgetting his name? Alan and Beatrice Gardner were two scientists. It's a, a psychologist and a biologist. Did a home rearing experiment in the 1960s teaching this young chimp sign language. Now, this was a good case where they decided they were gonna provide for her and all the other chimps for life, and that's what happened. And they did this kind of enculturation. They're teaching not just sign language, but all sorts of human types of skills, from yeah. tool use to sign language. That, you know, and then what happens when you enculturate another animal? You can't just put it back into a zoo easily. And in fact, there are a lot of very bad situations that have happened where orangutans and gorillas have then wound up in zoos and the zoos are not comfortable with it because they can't give them what they need from the, based on this kind of enculturation. So it makes it a difficult situation. Washoe continued uh, to be studied and worked with and actually became almost like a family member but in a more appropriate setting um, by Roger Fouts who was a student of the gardeners and he maintained her in a style that had to be maintained with other chimps. She lived with other chimps. She had an adopted baby. It was a whole colony of chimps, and that continued till her death, and they're still caring for those chimps. That, that was a good news ending, but let me tell you a really bad news ending and a sad ending, where some chimps who have been taught sign language wound up in medical labs, and that's, that's not responsible. I mean, whether you... And other chimps, there was another case where um, Maurice and Jane Temerlin, who were two uh, scientists in the 60s, they also taught a young chimpanzee named Lucy American Sign Language. As she got older, they had to give her up, and they wanted to rehabilitate her in a, in a reserve uh, in, in Africa. And when she went there, uh, one, of the, one of the students, their main student, was dead, so dedicated that she went there. And she, kept, she went with her, got her rehabilitated until they felt comfortable she could be released into the wild. And one trip when she came back, she actually found this chimp, Lucy, murdered, killed. And um, it's speculated, and again, it's pure speculation, that one of the reasons she may have been killed was because she was so used to coming to humans that she may not have avoided the mm. poachers. It's not clear, but it's something many people felt. So again, we need to think about this. What, what kind of responsibility is needed here if you're going to work with an animal and enculturate it? Yeah. And it's a real ethical issue. Mm. I mean, it's quite interesting perhaps to mention as well that the two stand-in 
animals that we worked with in Ming of Harlem, both of them had been, they were kind of harmed in their previous in, uh, living environments and taken in by sanctuaries or conservation centres. Uh, the tiger that we worked with in the film had been used on a leash to open malls in Texas um, and then was mistreated and, you know, brought to a kind of, you know, the zoo offered um, him a place. And the alligator was living in a pet shop um, and was kind of mishandled and both of them had the kind of damage of that situation. Yeah. So yes, the, the ethics, not just of animals in the kind of wild and, you know, in that sort of enculturement environment, I suppose, um, but also the ethics of how animals are handled and, and brought to the screen, yeah. in a sense, where do they come from and how are they kept and, you know, because there is a kind of dark side to the way that Hollywood um, brings its animals forward without, without necessarily it being ethical relative to how they're kept outside of that. Hmm. So when you say how they're brought to the screen, you mean you mean which animals are filmed and how? Uh, more, the, more in, in a sense a kind of duty of care relative to the, you know, a kind of knowledge around the particular creature being worked with. Mm-hmm. And a kind of, I suppose, a sensitivity to the environment of, of the screen. So, for example, in Ming of Harlem, one way that we uh, kind of worked around that was to go to where the animals lived rather than kind of, you know, transit them in in the back right. of the lorry and then just kind of temporarily stick them on some, some strange set in the middle of nowhere. So just, just kind of cursory adjustments like that, just the way of looking at it. You know, I think there's increased awareness of animal abilities now and an increased infra- in, uh, interest in getting better welfare for most animals. Yeah. Uh, but we keep, have to keep on pushing and making, you know, different industries more and more aware of this. Yeah. I, I want to say, in terms of um, the work with Meshi, I think one of the things that I was really um, taken with was again, remember when this happened, we wouldn't want to do this now, but at the time, there were so many things that um, your father was showing Harry before others showed it as well. So for example, you know, back in the 30s, they were starting to see um, from what, what your father showed and from what other people showed is, we're not the only tool users. Clearly, mm-hmm. they're capable of tool use. We saw the expression of emotion in, in Meshi, in all different ways from fear of snakes. Now we know that sh- they seem to show an instinctive fear of snakes, but not other things. That was early, that was an early documentation of that. Um, you know, the, the, the motor skill development exceeds that of children. All of these things were, were first shown in that film and a few of the other studies in the 1930s that really spurred other scientists to do more and more work. And now that work actually is serving to protect the animals. So again, there are a lot of studies that happen that we can say, gee, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't have done it then, but we didn't know. And as we know, we change how we, how we treat animals now and how we bring them into situations. Yeah. That does raise a uh, question that I have, or just something I've thought about that I'll try and uh, phrase in a, the right way. Um, but basically, so one of the things, as you're saying, that we see in the, in Mesh, in the film Meshi, um, is this sort of comparison between uh, human-like traits and and the chimpanzee behavior? Um, and it seems to me that there's there's something a little I don't quite know, but but it's that behavior is not even necessarily typical of all humans, right? I mean, like there's a wide spectrum on which humans exist, and I feel like there's some way that um, saying, oh look, chimpanzees are similar to humans is sort of um, there's something implicit there about saying, well, that means that we should be more compassionate towards that animal, or you know, value it differently, or um, and uh, I just wonder about um, uh, that sort of you know placing animals on the human uh, level and and um, that that being the only way that we can understand their like value or something. I I think that's a really important point. We tend to do that, and you know, it's interesting. So. I think when we, and maybe this is just a problem with us humans. I mean, I think that it's hard to often imagine another way. I mean, we know what we do and we equate that with being intelligent. So for, for since, 
I mean, since the fourth century, philosophers have said the thing that distinguishes us from other animals is language or tools. But language has been a big deal because for us, language, and when I say us, I'm talking about philosophers from ancient times on, have equated language with thinking. It's the external representation of our thought. How do you know another creature is thinking, has the capability of thought, unless you hear something that suggests they're thinking, right? So again, that's where a lot of these studies stem from, from teaching languages, giving them a way to express their thought, or showing that they can do something like us. Maybe that's a problem in our limits. I mean, you know, it's funny, I always worry, what if these animals are doing things that we can't even imagine? I mean, I think they probably do, and we keep on learning that they're doing things that we don't do. And again, it's, it's frustrating as a scientist because it may be right there in front of our eyes, right under our noses, and we're not perceiving it. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of yeah. stuck with this. But I'll give you another example. So many years ago, I did a couple of studies that made, got a lot of press showing dolphins and elephants w could recognize themselves in mirrors. And in fact, they show behaviors quite similar to what we do in a mirror. And they got a lot of press. And, it all, and people got really interested because they can wrap their heads around that. Yeah, I get that. I understand that. And maybe that's a shortcoming of that we have to show them in a, in, a, in a way related to us. But you know what? It gets people interested and they can relate to it. And hopefully we'll be able to extend that and get away from just what we do and find ways of showing more about what they do yeah. and appreciating them in their own right as well. I mean, actually, just to add to that, um, yeah, the anthropomorphizing of animals, that it, it is a shortcoming of ours, and we always, uh, the nature documentary is the perfect uh, example of this, how animals are simply placed at the kind of service of a human interest story or narrative or kind of emotional mm -hmm. uh, leaning emphasis, in, in, especially on screen, and looking, looking at ways to kind of make adjustments there as well as in our perceptions, if you like, yeah. of, of our animal language and uh, intelligence and, um, uh, yeah, awareness of things like death. You know, we, we, we never gave them, uh, accepted that animals could understand the, the concept of death. Um, are really important to kind of continue to grapple with. I really enjoy the example that philosophers are also writing about now, whereby um, the, there is a kind of feral nature of the city, whereby in the consulting and interpreting of other creatures' behaviour, mm -hmm. that's how we constituted urbanism and, and, and places. Uh, and that's a really important thing to remember, that we, we learn from watching and observing other species. Hmm. I just want to make one other comment that I think is, is important. You know, we talk about not anthropomorphizing. It's just as bad to be anth anthropocentric and not thinking other animals are capable. There's a, there's a middle ground there. We can be right sometimes when we anthropomorphize, and more and more scientists are saying this. It's equally wrong to over-anthropomorphize or over-anthropocentrize. Anthropocentrism is where you think we're the only ones capable of doing anything mm -hmm. intelligent. And that's clearly not the case. We know that now. So we have to sort of try to be, you know, find the right way. But it's, they're both an extreme equally bad to do. <laughs> um, OK, I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. And I think Harry has said he um, would answer some if anybody has something specific for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm Richard Miller from the American Museum of Natural History. I'm a, my predecessor on Natural History, can you hear me? Yeah. My predecessor yeah. on Natural History magazine, Douglas Preston, wrote a book called Dinosaurs in the Attic. One of the chapters was about Meshi, and it was one of the most effective, affecting, saddest stories that I ever read about an animal. And I want to take this opportunity to ask. Uh, Harry Raven, if this is true, if, it's, if this was a true account. And this is what it s said in this book, that years later, uh, when uh, Meshi was put in a zoo, and Harry Raven didn't see her for years, and decided one day to visit, uh, as the story is related, she, he went and he asked to be, uh, enter her cage. And the keeper said, no, you can't go in there. This is a very dangerous animal. And she is very uh, hostile to people and uh, out of the question. And uh, according to the story, your father persisted. And they said, all right, uh, let him in the cage and wondered what would happen. 
And what happened was that Meshi came slowly towards Harry Raven Sr. and embraced him gently and started crying into his shoulder. And the author, uh, Douglas Preston, said uh, that it was as if she was saying, I I'm your daughter. Why did you put me in jail? What did I do? And that, and that Harry Raven was crushed by this experience and, and it haunted him the rest of his life. Is that a true story, sir? Uh, let, let me comment on that. As I, I told you with the book, uh, Dinosaurs and Yerk, uh, and there were some things that were incorrect. But back to the, uh, my father's visit to the Brookfield Zoo, uh, where Meshi was, uh, he, he did visit, uh, but Meshi was impregnated by a huge chimpanzee, Mike, and uh, he, he was a good 200 pound. Uh, 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 Mike, uh, a, an attendant in the zoo, walked by Mike's cage. Mike reached out, grabbed his arm, pulled him as far as, now she was with him in the same cage. He, he pulled the attendant, bashed his head, body against the bench. Now she leaped in and she grabbed him also. And they, together they, uh, they almost killed him. And the other guys rushed to save him, which they did. Um, but back to my father's visit, he went to the cage and said, yes, uh, I would like to see my she open the cage. And said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. She's dangerous. Open the cage. I'll take responsibility. He said, okay. And what my father said was that, yes, and she did come out, recognized him. As far as how they interacted, I never heard any detail like that. Is it true or not? I, I just don't know. Um, well, affecting enough that she did recognize him after all those uh, years. Yes. Yes. Yes, apparently there was other doubt that she, she saw him, became excited. We have here with us a uh, Chris Hertzfeld, who has written numerous books and articles about uh, the great apes. She has taken marvelous photographs of the great apes, which have been exhibited widely. Would you want to say a few words? The story of Meshis was so important for me because it was one of the, the first case of a chimpanzee in a family with the Kellogg. And uh, what I have to do, when you said that it's amazing that Mushy recognized Henry uh, Kusher Raven, it's not special because they are highly social, so they recognize uh, every member of the group and then the zookeepers told me that, that when they, they go to see uh, some chimpanzee that they, 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 they knew before in the past, even after 20 years, they recognize the mm -hmm. zookeepers. So yeah. they can recognize the, the people. Yeah. I, I was going to comment on that too. So a friend of mine, Lynn Miles, who is an anthropologist, Study, you know, Lynn, she was, stu Chantac. yeah, she studied Chantac, who's in a orangutan. And when her project was ended, she didn't want to end it, it was ended for a number of political reasons. Um, they put Chantac in a zoo Atlanta. And I went with her to visit him, and we were with several other people Sue Savage Ramba, who studies bonobos and chimps, of, several of us went. And it was so 
poignant and sad because she didn't want to be separated from him. She did everything she could. She wanted to be able to, I mean, she almost felt like an, his mother in a way. Absolutely. But it, it was a forced separation. And when he saw her, um, he was alone and they could not incorporate him with other orangs. They're not normally, they're fairly solitary when they live in the wild. When you actually have orangutans together, they're fine. They can be quite social. It's just in terms of the ecology, they, they generally live alone in the wild. Um, but he saw her approach, he got so excited. He clearly recognized her, clearly. There was no question about it. He acted differentially. She was able to handle him. And he, and he signed. She had taught him sign language. She had been studying his development because she was an anthropologist. And one of the, after a while, he wanted to string necklaces and give them out. It was something she had taught him. And it was just so remarkable to watch this huge orangutan with these little beads, wetting the string, stringing these necklaces and handing them to Sue. And then she, I mean, uh, to uh, Lynn, and then handing them out. I mean, you just identified with the, 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 gen, the gentility was incredible. But there was clearly a connection that had continued. And you know, studies have shown if you actually work with a touch screen with chimps and other animals, birds can do this. They can recognize faces of their own member, of members of their group, and they can see differences in faces just like we can. These are highly social, highly intelligent animals. Yeah. Absolutely. I was with uh, Lynn Miles in Atlanta too, yeah. and uh, you know that uh, uh, Shamtek is able to make nuts. And it's a really difficult thing to learn when you are a child, but he learned it uh, with uh, Lynn, and she threw uh, a ring for him, mm -hmm. and she asked uh, to Shamtek to make a nut, and he did it with his big, huge yeah. hand, and it was very impressive, yes. And we saw the ability of Meshi to take apart knots and things like this. I mean, I don't want to skip to elephants, but years ago, there was a facility in California, Marine World Africa, USA, they kept on, they would have to chain the elephants in the enclosure at night, and then they would roam in this area in the daytime, just for safety's sake. They kept on finding one elephant outside, Every night, the barn door, they were, oh, sorry, they were, they would chain their leg inside the barn. And then the barn door was closed, locked from inside. And the, the keeper kept on saying, this elephant keeps on coming out. The, the door's open. And they stayed one night, and this elephant figured out. They have a trunk with two little fingers, if you're an Asian elephant, so that they can pick up little tiny things. This elephant, as soon as everybody left, would start working and pick the lock on his, with, 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 with something he had found, a piece of wire, and then went and there was a combination lock on the door of the barn and worked it, worked it, worked it, and, and opened that and got out. These are really smart animals and they need protection. Okay, I want to give people a chance. Yeah, uh, Christopher? Yeah. Uh, just one comment. Um, I couldn't help but notice that uh, all of the animals that we're talking about today uh, are animals that have the potential to kill us humans and that uh, we seem to be fairly comfortable with animals that, to kill and treat animals that don't have the ability to kill us with like little interest or we don't even pay attention to it. Like I think some 90% of all mammals walking the earth today are cattle or other food production animals and it seems to me that it's, it's kind of pointless in a way to talk about the philosophy about how we treat certain animals without recognizing that the, I mean, maybe not, that's not the exact distinction, but it's certainly the distinction that, that was demonstrated today. Uh, so that's just a comment, and if anyone has a you know, thought about that, I'd be interested to hear about um, Not really, I, I mean, I agree. There's a, you know, obviously predatory animals, these kind of prodigious, lonesome animals are, I mean, they, they've got a lot of screen value, and um, there's, a, there's, there's a reason why uh, this museum, so many of the exhibits, uh, kind of cinema was formed around these kind of creatures. Um, and yes, the kind of ruminants and the farm animals is it's it's perhaps another story. Um, but but I don't think the distinction is is is, is wholesale. I think it's lost something like fifty percent of all species of creatures in the last however many years, and uh, we're living in a, a very peculiar 
world environment relative to the presence of other species and you know yeah okay time's running out but it's a peculiar environment in that we're also dealing with kind of um, the um, resurrection of species now it seems in the laboratory where I know up in Harvard they think they're close to resuscitating the woolly mammoth for example so it's, 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 it's becoming kind of strange and perverse what we're capable of doing with other species so I just think it's a really complex agenda and, and a very difficult to rationalise yeah, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I'm just particularly with farm animals. A, a per- perfect example is our p- pigs. Highly intelligent, highly social, um, much more line perhaps dolphins, which we give a you know a lot of attention to. And again, I think this is a socio political situation. You know, we're eating pigs, so it's okay to treat pigs horribly. And we can say, oh, we're terrific, we're going to fight, we're going to protect all these other animals, which we should. But I, I agree, I think these, uh, all these animals need to better welfare. We need to think about these guys, too. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. We have time for one more. Yeah. Uh, Diane, what are some of the really big questions in your field that you would like to know the answer to, if you could? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so many. I mean, we're so ignorant about animals what their needs are, what we can do to improve their environment, how they think. I mean, there are a multitude of things. So I'm, that's a really boring answer maybe, but I just can't think of any one. You know, there's so many things we need to know. Do you ever wish you could talk to... I just saw Isabella. I would totally recommend this if anybody. Isabella Rossellini has a, a wonderful play up right now called Link Link Circus that Diana... Uh, Helped to bring to fruition, um, and uh, she the it sort of culminates with her being able to talk to her dog and ask her dog, you know, do you ever feel that way with the animals that you study? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think the the idea of being able to communicate with an animal on their terms is what I really like, rather than us teaching them English. That's what I do in my work. I try to decode dolphin communication, um, but and that I mean that I think just opens up a whole world of you know how we think with how we think about other animals, how what our relationship is to other animals. You know, there's this old story about King Solomon had a magic ring that let him communicate with animals. Conrad Lorenz, the ethologist, suggested maybe King Solomon's ring wasn't really a magical ring, that he had the power of observing. And I think that that's something that, that is very true. I think the more we observe, the more we're respectful and observe the nuances, watch them, they'll you can enter into communication. Most of you probably do already if you have a pet. Um, you, you communicate. You that show online. That's Link Link Circus, and it's playing over at uh, Hunter College, and it's only got a few more days to run. I saw it last night, and it is one of the most marvelous mm-hmm. theatrical and scientific productions that you ever will see. Thanks, Richard. And it's, got, it's, it's, being, it's at Hunter College until May 3rd. Yeah, she did a fantastic job. Okay, I wish we could keep going, um, but we have another screening, so I have to wrap up. Um, but I just want to reiterate my thanks uh, to Harry um, and his children for coming um, today, and to Philip for coming from London, and Diana for you know coming from Manhattan, and to all of you <laughs> um, for coming out here. And um, the next Science on Screen program is going to be May 31st. It is called Circle to Sphere. It's about the origins of the laser light show that began in Los Angeles in 1973, a program of really uh, rarely seen experimental short films, um, including the work of Jordan Belson. uh, And uh, there's a great show of his at Matthew Mark's gallery that opens in about a week um, of his paintings. You know, just goes with that. So yeah, please come back. Thank you.